So the next question you might be wondering is, how on earth do you train such systems? And that's a really great question. Now, I know you all work in many different industries, so feel free to adapt the following to your own area in your mind, but let's do a thought experiment and pretend they are trying to make a web connected system for farmers who are trying to classify apples and oranges to speed up the delivery of the picked fruits that are currently mixed together and need to be sent to the right destinations. Now, the first thing you need to do is identify the features or attributes of the fruits that you could measure. Let's take color and weight as an example, just like before. Both are easy to measure and can be represented numerically. You can use digital weighing scales and color values from a webcam that would allow you to do this. Now, going back to our high school maths, if you were to sample some apples and oranges and plot these values on a scatter chart as shown, you can see here that the red and green apples fall into the red and green spectrums on the x-axis of this graph and tend to cluster together with a similar weight variance in the y-axis. The oranges, as they're super juicy, tend to be heavier and are higher up on the chart. Now, if you can draw a line that separates the oranges from the apples, you can now with some degree of certainty decide what fruit something is simply by plotting its feature values on the chart. If it's above the line, it's most likely an orange. If it's below, it's probably an apple. You've essentially learnt how to classify the fruits. So if you can get a piece of software to define the equation of this line by itself, you can get a computer to then learn to classify fruits too. And this is the essence of what machine learning is doing behind the scenes. Not so magic, right? Essentially, you're just trying to figure out the best possible way to separate out the example data such that for a new unseen example, you have the best chance of classifying it correctly. But what if you've chosen bad features? Let's take ripeness and number of seeds. Here, the plot is less useful to us. There's no straight or even curved line that would allow us to separate these data points. You can't really learn from this data alone. And you might be thinking, but Jason, why would you choose such obviously bad features like this? And sure, with this trivial example, it's quite clear that this would be unwise, but what about those medical scans we spoke about earlier in the course that are just pixels in an image? How do you define features for that? It's not always so obvious. And what if you had more than two features? Previously, you had two features, so you used a two-dimensional chart to separate the data. If you had three features, you would need a 3D chart to do so, as shown here. Here, a weight dimension is added to our previously unsplittable features, and now you can use a plane, or a rectangle in 3D space, if you will, to separate the oranges from the apples. Hopefully, in this image, you can see that the oranges are now further back in the weight axes, making them separable from the apples. But it turns out that even three dimensions is typically not enough for most machine learning problems. It's not unusual to have tens, hundreds, thousands, even millions in the case of images where each pixel is a feature. As humans, You'll struggle to visualize anything higher than 3D. I tried myself and failed. However, for a computer, the mathematics works out just the same and is capable of doing such calculations. Instead of using a plane, you actually use something called a hyperplane, which simply means one dimension less than the number of dimensions that you have, allowing us to split the data just like you did here, but by using more features and attributes, which can sometimes lead us to better data separation. Now, when you're working with supervised learning, there are typically two types of problems you're trying to predict. First is a classification problem. What thing is represented by the inputs provided? Is it a cat or a dog, for example? You're trying to predict a specific class from a number of possible known classes. Second is a regression problem. This is where you're trying to predict some number from some other input numbers. For example, what is the price of a house if it's 1,000 square feet in size? You can see visually here how in these trivial examples, a single straight line is used to solve both types of problem. But in the first instance, it separates out the data, and the second, the line itself is used to predict the output value. So let's say you've got a dog and you've got a mop. It should be pretty easy to find the differences between these two images, right? Well, not so fast. It turns out in the real world, there are edge cases that can overlap. Even I, as a human, need to double check some of these images. And the reason I bring this up is to raise awareness about bias in training your data. 
one of the biggest challenges you will face is collecting enough training data that's truly representative of all the different situations you might encounter in the real world, like the edge cases you see here. And if you don't do this, then there's a good chance that the machine learning system will fail in these cases too. Imagine you wanted to recognize cats. You might need 10,000 images of different breeds of cats at different stages of their life, kitten versus adult, different fur patterns, different colors, all of which are taken at different angles and lighting conditions, even indoors versus outdoors, in order to be able to train a system that understands the essence of what cat pixels really are. Now, the other thing I'd like to point out here is that data is not always in the form of imagery. I use that in my slides as it's easy to view, but remember input data to train an ML system could be tabular data, text, sensor recordings, sound samples, or pretty much anything you want to classify so long as it can be represented numerically to be input into the model for training. So now you have a high level appreciation for what's going on behind the scenes, let's focus some more on gathering data and trying it for yourself. For this, you'll learn how to use a website known as Teachable Machine. This site was made by some friends at Google and is powered by a machine learning library for JavaScript, which is known as TensorFlow.js, which we'll learn more about later on in the course. Now, this site is great for prototyping, and in our case, to illustrate the importance of good quality input data. So go ahead, pause the video, and open teachablemachine.withgoogle.com in a new window, and place that window side by side so you can follow along as I show you how to use it. I'll wait for you to do that, and remember to hit play when you're ready to continue. All right, so to kick things off, let's hear from the creators of Teachable Machine to give us the overview before we use it together. People are training computers and creating machine learning models to explore all kinds of new ideas. New ways to interact. Yes. To understand the world. To play. And experiment. But machine learning is pretty intimidating to get into. So we've been wondering, what if it wasn't? With Teachable Machine, we set out to make it easier for anyone to create machine learning models without needing to write any machine learning code. When it first launched in 2017, it allowed everyone to get a feeling for what machine learning is all about. But now, Teachable Machine puts the power of machine learning in your hands, allowing you to save your models and use them in your own projects. So let's say you want to build a model to recognize you versus your dog. You just open up the site, record samples of you, and samples of your dog. Click train, and you instantly have your own machine learning model, which you can use in your sites, apps, and more. You can upload your model to host it online, or download it to work entirely on device. With Teachable Machine, you can create custom models for all sorts of things. Using images, audio, or even poses. Personalized machine learning models for the things that matter to you. And folks have already been trying it out, using Teachable Machine in their own experiments, solving problems in their communities, or even just at home. Start creating and see where your ideas take you at g.co slash teachable machine. Great, so now you know what the system can do, follow along with me to make your very first machine learning model to recognize any object in your room. Okay, so when you head over to Teachable Machine, you should see a website that looks something like this. As you can see, it supports many different types of projects. First is image recognition, the second is audio recognition, and the third is pose recognition. All of these are models that are powered by TensorFlow.js that you'll learn more about in the next lesson. Now today, we're going to focus on image recognition just to teach you the basics of gathering data. So click on that and then click standard image model as shown. You should then see a screen that looks something like this. On the left hand side, we've got the objects we want to detect. At the moment, they're called class one, class two, and so on. Let's give it a more meaningful name. So the first thing I'm going to call Jason. And the second thing I'm going to call Bottle. As shown. Okay. So. We now can click on webcam, enable access to our webcam if it's the first time using this site, 
And if you allow access, you should then see your webcam come into view. Now, if you've got multiple webcams, you can click on the drop down to select the right one. And now we're going to hold to record some images of the thing of interest. Now, this one is Jason, so that's me. And of course, you're going to record your own things over there. So feel free to change your names as needed. And I'm just going to try and get some sample images of myself right here. Note that I move my head around to get some variation as well. I've got about 43 images and that's great. That should be enough. We now go to bottle, click on webcam. And here I'm going to try and recognize this bottle instead. So I'm going to try and get the same number of images as before. And that's important because if you have too many of one class, statistically speaking, the machine learning will think that that's more likely to appear just naturally. So it might learn just to predict that object all the time. And of course, when it's training, it would be right 90% of the time. So it's important to have roughly the same number of examples for your training data. Let's try and do the same thing here with the bottle nice and close to the webcam and get roughly the same number 40 something images. 44, that's close enough. Now, let's go ahead and train our model. And what's happening now is that live in the browser, TensorFlow.js is going to retrain the model so it can distinguish between these two different object types. And you can see it's already finished. It happened pretty fast. And you've now got a preview on the right hand side of it in action. Now you can see right now that it says Jason with 100% confidence, which is technically correct. And if I bring the bottle into view, it switches to bottle with 100% confidence, which is also now correct. Jason, bottle, Jason, bottle. And look how fast that is. It works in real time. And this is very usable for a prototype, for example. Now, if this is good enough for your needs, you can actually click on export model at the top here, click on download, and then click on this button here to download the model files. This will contain things like a model.json and some binary files you can host on your website to then use in any way you wish. And of course, we're giving you some example code down below here that you can use to get started. But don't worry about that for now. We'll be teaching you all about how to code later on. So for now, let's go back and focus on training data. Now, I just trained a system that recognizes the difference between me and a bottle. And that's great, but let's try other bottles to see if it manages to recognize those too. Let's try this one. Pretty good, not too bad. It, it seems to be recognizing that shape is important here. And let's just try one with a different color as well. And again, it gets that that is actually a similar thing. Now, this is great. However, if I bring into view this kind of jar-like object, it's not quite as sure, but you know, it gets to the 90s, which is you know pretty confident. So we might want to train a system to be better at recognizing jars, for example. So in order to do that, we can add another class on the left here, maybe call it jar, like so. And now we can add training data for that. So let's go ahead and get roughly 45 images of this jar here. Let's uh, open that up like so. And get roughly the same number of images. 44 is good enough. Hit on retrain to train the model once again between three objects this time, not two. And now you can see we've got Jason bottle or jar showing. And if I show it the jar, it's now 100% confident that that is a jar, which is correct. And let's go ahead and test the bottles again. It's always good to retest things. The bottle is 100% confident there. And our Coca-Cola bottle, 100% confident. And let's bring that green one again back into view. And oh, what happened here? It actually thinks it's a jar. And why might that be? Well, looking at these two objects, you can see that they're both green or a lot of green contained within them, right? So what's happened is that it thinks that a jar is just some green object, whereas a bottle is this kind of bottle shaped object, right? Um, so in order to get around this, you're going to have to add more training data to your examples to, to improve the accuracy. And so it knows that this is in fact a jar versus a bottle. So what we're going to do here, well, for this bottle over here, we're going to go back to the bottle training data, click on webcam, and we're going to add some examples of this bottle to the scene so that we know that this is a green bottle. Okay. So let's go ahead, put that in view and click hold to record. And there we go. We've got about 84 images now. Now, because I've got 84 images of bottle, I need to go and get some more training data for my other classes as well. So let's go back to Jason. Oh, let's move the bottle out of view because that'd be contaminating my data. Um, I'm going to click train model and get some more of me. Oh, sorry, not train model. Click hold to record. Ah, so now I'm going to click hold to record to get some more training data of me. So roughly 77 there. Let's get a bit more. 80, okay, 90, okay, wait, that's close enough to 84, that should be fine. 
And now let's do the same thing for jar as well. So open up the webcam for jar and put this back into view here. And let's get some variation of the jar and get roughly, oh, 93. Okay, that should be close enough. So now if I click on train model here, we're gonna have a lot more training data. It, take, it might take a bit more time, but we should now get a more reliable output model that can distinguish these things. So here we go, Jason, 100% correct. Bottle number one, close enough to 100, that's good. Bottle number two, straight in there, 100, very mm -hmm. good. Bottle number three, which was the one that was causing us problems before, 100%, beautiful. And now if we try the jar, hopefully it still remembers that this thing over here is a jar. And as you can see, we've now trained a much more robust model. So go ahead and explore yourself with objects in your room to see what you can recognize and what causes problems and what doesn't. As you experienced, the machine learning model you created was as good as the data that you presented to it. The more data you use, the better it can be at generalizing, just like the image shows on this slide. All of these objects are bottles, but if you only use one type in training, the model could struggle to detect the other types in the future. Instead of learning that color was the distinguishing feature, it might learn that shape was more important, leading to a more robust system. As you saw, in this use case where images were the input, you do not have control over what features it decides are important, as it will decide by itself based on the data presented what distinguishing features provide the best data separation. And by providing varied inputs, it has less chance of choosing wrong features. Be careful though, in all the images I just showed you, I used my hand to hold the object. In this case, it could learn that the hand is the thing to recognize and not the object itself. Technically speaking, it would be correct as my hand existed in every single image that we showed it, but as a human, you know that this was not the intended outcome. Continue to explore using Teachable Machine to see what edge cases you can find that lead issues for the object you're trying to recognize. Maybe try other objects too, if they're similar, and see how that goes.